Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Partnering for Opioid Addiction Prevention webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you wish to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And as a reminder, this conference is being recorded today. I would now like to turn the conference over to David Wilson. Please go ahead, sir. Happy National Prevention Week, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am David Lamont Wilson, Public Health Analyst at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, or CSAP. I will be your moderator for this NTW 2018 Partnering for Opioid Addiction Prevention webinar. Now, today's discussion is a critical one for preventionists. The opioid crisis has become our crisis next door, and as a recent White House media campaign illustrates, the opioid crisis is touching every community around the country, and the stories are heartbreaking. Now, this final installment of our National Prevention Week webinar series was developed specifically to support organizations working on the front lines of opioid addiction prevention. So before we begin, I would like to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, please, please, please use the chat pod to send us your thoughts and questions throughout each speaker's presentation. We will have time at the end to answer some of your questions. Two, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on SAMHSA's YouTube page. So if you have colleagues or coalition partners who weren't able to join us, they can assess it on demand when it is available. And lastly, we will make the slide presentation available after the webinar so you'll have the information and all of the resources uh, that we discussed today at your fingertips. Now, I am so excited that we are joined by four outstanding presenters. First, we have Captain Jennifer Fan, my colleague, and SAMHSA's Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. From the Centers for Disease Control, we have Lysandra Cordier. We also have Dr. William Haining, representing the American Society of Addiction Medicine, and joining us from the, the Boys and Girls Club of America, we have Lauren Barano. Now, this presentation and all of their presentations will highlight effective collaborations and resources at the local and community levels to prevent opioid addiction and other practical steps. For those of you or us who are exploring partnerships with organizations in their communities. But before I turn it over to our first speaker, as coordinator of National Prevention Week, I wanted to say a few words about NPW, what we've accomplished, and more importantly, what's next. Now, as you all may know, National Prevention Week is an annual observation dedicated to increasing awareness and action around substance abuse and mental health issues. Now, this year's theme, Action Today, Healthier Tomorrow, reminds us that simple daily acts of prevention, such as helping a friend make positive choices or supporting a family member in need, can lead to healthier lives for each of us today and stronger, healthier communities tomorrow. And as you can see, each day of NPW will focus on different and pressing health themes and encourage, and encourage you and your communities to discuss various aspects of prevention. So far, SAMHSA has heard about communities around the country hosting health fairs and trainings and town halls and Twitter chats and mural paintings and all types of other NPW activities and events to contribute to our growing conversation around prevention. Now, there's still time for you and your community to get involved in NPW. And if you have the NPW 2018 planning guide and resource calendar, you can do that. And if not, you can order one from our SAMHSA store at www.samhsa.gov. And there, with that resource, you can explore ideas and resources to help you organize an activity this month for MPW. Now, when you plan your activity or event, let us know about it. 
Submit your event or activity on the website using the link that you see on the screen, and we will help you spread the word about your event. It's still time to participate in this year's prevention challenge that we call Dear Future Me. Now, throughout May, we will continue building our National Prevention Week digital mosaic, and we would love to include your contribution. All you need to do is write a letter to your future self about the actions you are doing today to ensure a healthier tomorrow. Share your letter or picture or video on Twitter and Instagram or Facebook using the Dear Future Me hashtag, and we'll add your post to our digital mosaic. We're so close to completing the image, and we would love for your letters to be a part of it. So again, visit www.samsa.gov forward slash prevention hyphen week to learn more. Now make sure to visit the National Prevention Week website to stay connected and access helpful free resources to, to support your prevention work. And a good way to stay connected, involved with National Prevention Week is to sign up for our Prevention Works email listserv so you can receive NPW updates and news about NPW 2019. Scroll to the bottom of the page where it says Stay Connected on the right sidebar of the main NPW page to sign up today. Our site features many resources and tools for anyone to use to participate in NPW and engage audiences in substance abuse prevention. So check out the news and announcements section for the latest addiction, additions and activities. And if you have any questions about MPW, please let us know in the chat box. Now, as we all know, prevention doesn't only happen once a year or, or once a week. Prevention should and does happen every day. Every year, National Prevention Week is the culmination and amplification of your prevention activities that are taking place each and every day year-round. And now, even with all of our 2018 successes, don't forget that you can use the NPW tools and resources that I have mentioned to help you keep the prevention conversation going year-round. So lastly, to get ready for National Prevention Week 2019, SAMHSA is excited to expand one of our three NPW goals to include a focus on showcasing effective and successful evidence-based prevention programs across the country. Organizations and communities are looking for effective models to emulate and, and learn more about these evidence-based programs will help the work that you are implementing in your communities to not only prevent opioid addiction, but other health themes featured in our NPW activities as well. Now, if you have a program that could be a great example, we look forward to hearing about it in the months ahead. So with that, let's start today's program. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Captain Jim Fan, or Jennifer Fan, is the Acting Deputy Director of the, C of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. She is also CSAP's subject matter expert on prescription drug and opioid abuse. So without any further ado, welcome my colleague, Jennifer Fan, and thank you, Jennifer, for kicking off today's conversation. Hi, thank you, David, and thank you, SAMHSA, for uh, inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. Um, as you know, the United States has been in the grips of an opioid crisis for a few years. Uh, and I just want to put out there that um, the things that we do, um, it's important to evaluate um, the, those programs and, and, and the responses and see if there's room for improvement. And so in terms of my presentation, um, I'll touch, first I'll touch upon the national data on the opioid crisis. And then um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go into uh, what SAMHSA is doing in regards to this and, and what uh, prevention resources are out there from SAMHSA. 
Um, this chart shows misuse of prescription pain relievers and other prescription psychotherapeutics in 2016 um, from the National Survey of uh, uh, Drugs uh, Use uh, Household. It's the Sorry, sorry, National Survey on Drug Use and Health. It's a long acronym, uh, NISDA. Um, so basically in 2016, um, when looking at people ages 12 and older, 3.3 million people were current misuses of pain relievers. Uh, 1.8 million people had a pain reliever use disorder. Um, and then compared to 2015, there were 2 million people. So the number is actually going down, which is great. Um, unfortunately, nearly 600,000 people had a heroin use disorder, and, and compare that to 2015, that number is about the same. Um, if you look at adolescents and young adults, 239,000 adolescents, which is um, ages between 12 to 17, were current misuses of pain relievers. Um, 631,000 of young adults, ages um, 18 to 25 had misused pain relievers in the past month. So also in 2016, um, we had 42,249 opioid overdose deaths, um, which is equal to 116 Americans uh, die each day from an opioid overdose. And this is the highest in U.S. history and five times higher than in 1999. 77% um, of opioid overdose deaths occur outside a medical setting. So in April 2018, the Surgeon General issued an advisory to urge more people to have naloxone on hand and know how to use it. Um, this is a graph from CDC, and it, it's, it, it tells a story of what has been happening since, two, since the year 2000. Um, overdose deaths from prescription opioids have been um, overall decreasing since 2011. That's, that's the good news. However, if you look at heroin, um, you see the rise in heroin, heroin in 2010, which is slightly before the decrease in the prescription drugs, and it shoots up. And um, heroin-related overdose deaths uh, more than quadrupled since 2010. Nearly 13,000 people have died in 2010. Um, more than doubled for 18 to 25 year olds in the past decade. And the thing to note is non-medical use of prescription opioids is a key risk factor for conversion to heroin use. Um, approximately three out of four new heroin users report that they had abused prescription opioids prior, prior to using heroin. Um, now, if you also notice other synthetic opioids, that has also increased dramatically, and that has fueled um, the, the target drug there is fentanyl, and that actually has fueled the rise in the heroin overdose deaths. Um, according to DEA, the number of fentanyl reports have been rising since 2013. So in 2013, there were 978 reports um, of uh, fentanyl seizures uh, from DEA. Um, 2014, 4,697, 2015, 14,440, and in 2016, 34,204 reports were on fentanyl. So from 2013, 978 to 2016, over 34,000. Uh, fentanyl is 25 to 50 times more potent than heroin. Um, they have also seen carfentanil also being um, in the heroin. Um, and carfentanil, which is an elephant tranquilizer, and it only takes about two milligrams of carfentanil to bring down an elephant. Um, and carfentanil is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Um, now, um, what the White House is doing, the White House has put out basically three initiatives um, on March 19th. Um, basically, to reduce drug demand through education awareness and preventing overprescription. Uh, two, to cut off the flow of illicit drugs across our borders and within our communities. And three, saving lives um, by expanding opportunities for proven treatment for opioid and other drug addiction. Um, the good thing is, is that many of um, SAMHSA's opioid prevention programming um, 
is, is already in place to support these three initiatives. HHS has also put out a five-point five strategy to address the opioid crisis. Um, first one is better access uh, to addiction prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, the second one is to have timely reporting of data as, uh, as well as increasing the, the quality of the data. Um, the third is to, um, to, to have uh, better pain management um, protocols or, or, or evidence-based uh, methods of pain management, have that readily accessible and, and implemented. Um, the fourth, having access to naloxone, not just access to naloxone, but the training of how to use naloxone. And with it, it also comes with um, uh, education and uh, increased knowledge of, of what an overdose is, how do you, uh, what do you do in case of an overdose, in, in addition to what naloxone is, how to use it, and, and all of that information. Um, and the fifth and final uh, strategy point is basically better research, um, not just on addiction, but as pain as well. Um, um, now, this is the Behavioral Health Continuum of Care fan, and we know that in order to address this opioid crisis, all parts of the FAN needs to be uh, targeted. So um, promotion, prevention, treatment, and recovery. And in the prevention arm where I'm at, all three categories are programs to address. Universal, which is a broad population base. Selective, targeting those high-risk communities. And indicated, um, going more to the individual where they're using but not yet diagnosed with an addiction. Um, now, this is tying this data um, graph basically informs us where those prevention programs need to be targeted. Um, if you notice the red portion of that circle, that's 53%. 53% of the people who misuse their prescription drugs receive them from a friend or family, whether it's um, for free, uh, stolen, uh, purchased, um, whatnot. And where, they, uh, where those medications are attained from, uh, they're originally prescribed by a physician. Um, the second large portion of the pie is the lighter blue uh, section, 38%. 38% of the people who misuse their prescription drugs um, receive them from a healthcare provider, whether it's been prescribed or stolen. Um, the other portion, 6% bought from a drug dealer or a stranger, and 3% is others such as um, online pharmacies or, or, or um, things of that nature. So basically, um, your target audience for prevention programs, your prescriber, as well as the um, general population about uh, providing them knowledge of, of the risk of um, giving a, a friend or family member uh, prescription meds um, without a prescription. Um, this is basically a list of SAMHSA and HHS programs that address the opioid crisis. Um, we have state targeted response grants that goes to states. We have block grants. Um, we have programs that uh, provide education training and accessibility to naloxone. Um, we do have programs that target um, pregnant and postpartum women, um, especially in regards to the neonatal abstinence syndrome. We have criminal justice programs, recovery housing training programs, and um, family inclusion medical emergencies. We definitely want to um, provide more outreach to the families so that when a person um, is connected to uh, treatment uh, services and recovery, you want to make sure that they have the support that can help them maintain um, the, 
the recovery process. Um, very quickly, we have a lot of prevention grant programs. Um, they basically fall into a variety of, of buckets. Um, the first one, community-based coalition enhancement grants to address local drug crises. It's a long name, um, but these grants are basically your primary prevention grants to communities. These are in connection to our drug-free um, community support program grants. <clears throat> Those are relatively new, and they it's wonderful that they, they, they go directly to the community. <clears throat> the second one, Strategic Prevention Framework, Partnerships for Success, fifth PFS. Um, this is an older grant program that we have. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And it targets um, two of our top prevention priorities, underage drinking, um, for those between the ages of 10 and 20, and in prescription drug misuse and abuse among those between 12 and 25. Um, these are also um, utilizing the primary prevention programs to target these audiences. Um, there is 70 awards uh, and four cohorts. The next one, Strategic Prevention Framework Prescription Drugs, FIFRX. This is also a primary prevention program um, um, use. Uh, basically, it encourages states, these grants go to states, it encourages states to look at their prescription drug mon monitoring program data to see where those hotspots are in your communities and states. And then you, once you have identified those, you use your primary prevention programs and you put those programs in those communities. Um, so it's a more efficient use of your resources. Um, the next three bullets, they fall into the naloxone bucket. Um, the first two are basically providing education and training to first responders uh, about uh, naloxone. Uh, first responders as well as communities as well. Um, but in regards to naloxone, um, in addition to, those funds can also be used to purchase naloxone and um, and, and use them for also to, to create the kit and to distribute the naloxone as well. And lastly, the State Targeted Response to Opioid Crisis Grants, otherwise known as Opioid STR. And this grant puts together prevention, treatment, and recovery. And it, it, the money goes to states, and the states have to have a comprehensive uh, strategic plan that addresses all three um, all three uh, sections of the Frankfurt of Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery. Uh, in the past, there was an 80% um, cap where 80% must be used for treatment, I believe 5% for administration, uh, administrative uh, uh, items, and the rest um, can go to prevention and recovery. But remember, the strategic plan has to encompass prevention, treatment, and recovery. Um, just recently, not too long ago, that 80% cap has been lifted. So there is um, no, no cap. So the state can use their discretion in how the, that money is going to be used. Um, in terms of prevention resources, um, 2013 was uh, our Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit was released. Um, it, it's very user friendly and you can pull out certain sections and, and provide it to um, a certain types of audience. So for example, there's a section that can go to the prescriber, there's a section that can go to community leaders, um, section, uh, so, um, so it's, and basically it talks about naloxone, um, what it is, how to use it, how to identify uh, an overdose what to do if you come across a person who is going through an overdose. <clears throat> um, there's been one revision, that's, uh, it's also in Spanish, uh, and I believe we're going through another revision to trying to co incorporate the information on fentanyl. Um, concerning since fentanyl is so much more potent than heroin, 
it sometimes takes more than one or two doses of naloxone to, to be uh, successful in, in reversing that overdose. Um, we also have, this past December, released 13 fact sheets titled um, Prescription Pain Medications, Know the Options, Get the Facts. Um, and these are designed to increase awareness of the risks associated with prescription opioid use and misuse, as well as educate patients who are prescribed opioids for pain about the risks and provide resources for methods of alternative pain management. Um, SAMHSA also um, sponsors online training for um, prescribers on how to um, prescribe opioids for chronic pain, um, what other options there are for pain instead of going straight to an opioid, and when a patient is on an opioid, what to do, how to monitor a patient, um, uh, urine analysis, um, all of that information. Um, we also have naloxone training for the prescriber and pharmacists online as well. And then my last slide. Um, so we know that in order to address this crisis effectively, we need to be able to collaborate um, with, with so many um, types of people in the community. Um, on this line, it lists a variety of, of stakeholders that can be included. Um, but you also have to think, who is not at the table? Who do we usually not work with um, but can have an impact um, on, on, this, uh, on this crisis? So I think uh, take a pause for a minute and just think about who else could be part of, part of your community that can, that can have an impact. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, do I go ahead and hand off to the next one, or? No, oh, you can you can hand it right back over to me, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you David. Um, that was very valuable information, but you really did a great job of over giving a uh, a good overview of all of the things that SAMHSA has to offer when it comes to opioids. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have questions, please, please, please uh, put them in the chat box. And I saw one question that came in, so I want to remind everybody that the slides will be available after the webinar, so you will have all of the resources and, and information at your fingertips. Um, so next, our next speaker, Lissandra Cordier is the communications team lead for the Center for De Disease Control and Prevention's National Center for Injury Prevention and Controls Division of Unintentional Injury Prevention. That's, oh. <laughs> That's a lot of prevention. <laughs> a lot of prevention, which is great. But in this role, Ms. Cordier provides guidance on the planning, implementation and evaluation of health communications and marketing activities for the division. Previously, she has worked as a health communications specialist at CDC with the National Center for Environmental Health in their division of laboratory sciences and with the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response in the Division of Emergency Operations. Ms. Cordier has a bachelor's in psychology, and a minor in mass communications from the University of Georgia, and research nonverbal communication. She also holds a master's of public health with a, with a specialization in maternal and child health from the University of Georgia. And I am so pleased to have her as one of the speakers representing one of National Prevention Week's uh, federal partners, the CDC. So take it away, LaShawn. Thank you, and I am very happy to be here. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, and uh, as mentioned, my name is LaShondra, and I'm a health communication lead in CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of CDC's cross-cutting work in response to the evolving opioid epidemic. Uh, first, I'm going to highlight some data similar to Jennifer with the previous presenter, and then I'm going to cover how CDC is partnering in the space 
and working to prevent opioid-related harms and overdose deaths. Uh, finally, I'm going to highlight the importance of partnering and increasing public awareness, along with some resources that CDC has developed to help uh, those fighting this epidemic on the front lines. So I'm going to start with some data, and I'm going to see if I can get my slides to work. Yay! So um, first up, what you're looking at is a, a, a snapshot of uh, trends over the years, and we all know that many have been touched directly or indirectly, uh, family members or friends, um, with uh, opioid use disorder or uh, opioid overdose death. Um, and each of the personal stories that I think we've all heard and, and continue to hear are really reflected in this data that we're seeing. And what you see in front of you is a time series map that shows county level drug overdose deaths starting from 2000 to 2016. And you can see the shift. Um, we all know that drug overdoses are on the rise and the trend is very evident in these maps that it continues to go up and it's unrelenting. Every state is seeing dramatic increases in death rates. Um, some states in the Appalachia area, the Northeast and the Southwest uh, being uh, amongst the hardest hit. So I just wanted to kind of showcase that so people could kind of see. The next slide I'm going to talk to you about is really focusing on the change in the epidemic over the last few years. And Jennifer spoke to this a little bit in her data, but what we've seen is from 1999 to 2016, that there's been more than 350,000 people that have died from an overdose involving any opioid, whether it's prescription or illicits like heroin. The epidemic is continuing to evolve, and the rise in opioid deaths can be outlined in three waves. Uh, the first wave we kind of see began um, in the 90s with the increased prescribing of opioids and overdose deaths increasing involving prescription opioids specifically. The second wave began around 2010 uh, with rapid increases in overdose deaths involving heroin. And then the third wave really started around 2013 where we started to see some real increases in overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids, uh, particularly those involving fentanyl or illegally manufactured fentanyl. And we're finding that illegally manufactured fentanyl can often be found in combination, as mentioned before, with heroin, counterfeit pills, cocaine, and other drugs. So as this epidemic continues to evolve, opioid overdoses continue to increase across all regions of the United States and for both men, women, and most, most age groups. So, you know, what does that mean? Um, I think we all know that this epidemic is devastating families across America. Um, in addition to the serious risk of addiction and abuse and overdose, there are other opioid-related harms that I want to note before I get into the rest of my presentation. Um, one, we're seeing an increase in issues that occur in newborns exposed to opioids, and that includes neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, which is withdrawal symptoms including irritability, seizures, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and poor feeding in newborns. There's also uh, adverse childhood experiences that are happening around um, both positive and negative where you're seeing increases in children in the foster care system, as well as other exposure to abuse and neglect and traumatic experience that impact uh, all individuals as they're growing up in any household. So this is particularly something that we're seeing in households where there's substance abuse and the negative consequences of that. Additionally, I want to point out that other opioid-related harms that we're seeing are things like hepatitis and HIV infections, which are increasing. And for us, and I think for everyone, part of attending to the opioid epidemic also means addressing these health outcomes, not just uh, focusing on opioid use disorder or opioids specifically, that it, it's all kind of interrelated and that there's a, a bigger piece of the puzzle that we have to put together. So CDC is working um, to do some prevention in this space. And so our focus is typically around preventing opioid overdoses, but we're committed to doing that and working to save lives to prevent all negative health effects of this epidemic. And we take a public health approach to addressing those key uh, aspects of the epidemic and truly focus on a few things that I want to highlight. One is improving data quality and tracking trends. So we do conduct surveillance and research to better understand and respond to the epidemic. We also collect and analyze data on opioid-related overdoses to better identify areas that need assistance and to evaluate prevention efforts. We've also been focusing on building prevention efforts and equipping states with resources, not just improving data collection, so making sure that they have the support that they need for evidence-based strategies. Um, some of the work CDC does in this space is, uh, includes three particular programs where we equip states with resources needed to address the epidemic. The three programs we focus on are prescription drug overdose, um, data-driven prevention initiative, and the enhanced state opioid overdose surveillance initiative. And those three programs really provide resources and information to help combat prescription and illicit opioid abuse and overdose. And they're really at the heart of the work that we do here at the Injury Center. 
The other aspects of our work focus on supporting healthcare providers and health systems, and we do that by providing data, tools, guidance like our CDC guidelines and other evidence-based decision-making tools to help improve prescribing practice and, and increase patient safety. Uh, we also partner with public safety, and um, that's another aspect of what we're doing, and that includes uh, law enforcement and others to help address the growing illicit opioid problem. And then finally, um, the thing that I'm going to be talking about the most is really encouraging consumers to make safe choices and empowering them in that space. And so part of that means for us raising awareness about prescription and other opioid misuse and overdose. I think in the long term it's important to note that our work will hopefully reduce opioid-related harms like opioid use disorder, hepatitis, and HIV, um, and, and ultimately will reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths that we're seeing in, in communities across the nation. So this slide I think is important to kind of cite, to cite the importance of connection in communities. So this is a national epidemic. It does need community-based solutions, and we've found that some of the best ways to prevent opioid overdoses specifically are to improve prescribing, reduce exposure to both illicit and prescription opioids, prevent misuse, and as has been mentioned before, treat, uh, treat opioid use disorder and, those, uh, and provide treatment for those in need. So prevention and response really does take a coordinated effort, um, and that includes communities, healthcare providers, public health, law enforcement, and all other sectors to really address this ongoing problem. And CDC, we think are, and hope uh, that we're helping facilitate that prevention, that preparedness, and those response activities by supporting states and local communities and tribes in their efforts. So I'm going to share some of the resources that have been instrumental in our partnerships and talk about some of those partnerships um, and the products that have resulted from them. So I'm going to skip to slide 38. So I want to talk a little bit about the problem of prescription opioid use. Um, we're finding that nearly 200,000 people have died from overdoses involving prescription opioids since 99, 1999. And in 2016, we found that we were losing 46 people a day just to prescription opioid overdose deaths. So um, I do want to highlight some of the more common drugs involved in prescription opioid overdose are like methadone, oxycodone, or oxycontin, and hydrocodone, or Vicodin, and things like that. Um, and what we're seeing is that the research shows that there are risk factors that make people particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to prescription opioid abuse and overdose, and that includes things like taking overlapping prescriptions, um, taking high d daily doses of prescription pain medication, um, having mental illness or a history of alcohol or other substance abuse, and living in areas, rural areas, or having low income. So we're seeing an increase, and, and the data on the slide really shows that, you know, in 2016 there were over 214 million prescriptions dispensed in the U.S., and over 17,000 deaths involving a prescription opioid specifically. And as part of our efforts to combat that, we um, launched a campaign. So for us, it was really important to help Americans understand the severity of the epidemic and raising awareness, as I've mentioned before, about opioid use disorder and overdose is kind of a key component of prevention. So we launched the ARCS Awareness Communication Campaign, uh, which features testimonials from people who are recovering from opioid use disorder and those who have lost loved ones to prescription overdose. The goal of the campaign was really to educate about the risks and then focus on the importance of discussing safer and more effective pain management options uh, with healthcare providers and also promoting awareness of risks associated with recreational or non-medical use. So the campaign itself targeted adults 25 to 54 um, and as I mentioned features real stories of real people. So it only takes a little to lose a lot is our tagline, and the campaign, which is evidence-driven, um, really looked at folks who were negatively impacted by prescription opioid use. We ran a 14-week pilot in four states, Ohio, Oregon, Rhode Island, and West Virginia, and in 2017, after a successful completion of our pilot and evaluation of that pilot, we launched the campaign in uh, four other additional states, Kentucky, Ohio, Massachusetts, and New Mexico. Um, we chose those states and some of the counties specifically in those case states because of burden and um, level of interest and readiness to run a campaign. However, we anticipate partnering with others to increase launch and reach of the campaign message. So what we did was we designed this campaign specifically for state and local health departments and community organizations really to to use and tailor the RX Awareness campaign messages themselves because they were pre-tested materials that we knew were successful and effective. Um, we developed these resources and made them available for free so partners could launch campaigns of their own, support local prevention activities that were going on with this shared message, and then again raising awareness about risk. 
And so the materials that we've developed included digital advertisements, um, everything from static to um, animated uh, web ads. We created social media ad advertisements and posts. We created radio PSAs, television uh, commercials, as well as digital videos, and then billboards and out-of-home placements like posters and uh, bus ads. Then I just want to move into some other resources that we have available. Um, so we also partnered with quite a few providers and health uh, systems to create and disseminate uh, education and training. So in an effort to really support healthcare providers, which is one of those elements that I showed earlier, um, and we really wanted to improve the way opioids were being prescribed, so we launched a series of interactive online trainings specific to providers. Um, the trainings feature recommendations from the CDC guideline. They provide sample scenarios, feedback, uh, resources, conversation scripts to help patients and providers discuss opioids. Um, and the series is available completely for free um, with continuing education and medical education credits offered. Um, there are going to be 11 modules in this training series. We've got five that have been posted to date. Um, and then previous to this, we uh, released a seven-part webinar series as part of our clinician outreach and communication activity um, in partnership with the University of Washington to help provide um, well, to help providers in general choose the most effective pain treatment options and improve patient safety for prescribing. So we really focused on getting providers what they needed and training them after listening to what they were looking for and needing and, and providing them with something that could also give them medical education. Then we developed a mobile app as well because we heard that there was a need for readily available information at your fingertips. So to help that, we work with providers um, as well on content to develop a, a, a free mobile app that is available to all who are on Android or Apple. Um, and it has the clinical recommendations from the CDC guideline and helps put them into practice by providing you immediate tools and resources. So we know that managing chronic pain is complex, but we feel like accessing prescribing guidance shouldn't be. And so the app is free, as I mentioned before, and it includes an MME or morphine milligram equivalent calculator, which is helpful to providers, physicians, pharmacists. Um, and then it also has a summary of the recommendations, an interactive interviewing feature to help providers, again, practice effective communication skills, and a series of other links and resources to uh, other activities and options for them if they need information. We also partner to develop patient materials and public-facing materials. And so we've developed a series of educational resources, um, including those with partners. The, we've worked with federal partners and others, like the American Hospital Association, to develop fact sheets and other materials that um, can raise awareness among patients about the opioid epidemic and the role that they truly play in the prevention aspect of that. So we've got infographics around outlining ways to manage chronic pain, key concepts around our CDC guideline, talking about discussing and conversation starters for your uh, for patients, and so we've got a lot of information in that space. We've got audio podcasts available uh, on the, at the link that you see uh, on the screen. We also have informational fact sheets about what you need to know about opioids, if you're prescribed opioids, and other one-pagers that can be easily read and used to help really increase patient knowledge and their confidence and safety regarding pain management. So there are several fact sheets that we cover topics like opioids and pregnancy, uh, opioids and chronic pain, as I've outlined, and then also acute pain and knowing the symptoms of an overdose. So we have a tip card, uh, that's the image on the screen here, that talks about you know, signs and symptoms of an overdose, what to do if someone is overdosing, um, and the steps you need to take in terms of helping prevent that. Uh, so this is my final slide, um, and I just I, I put this here for uh, several reasons. One is a reminder that everyone really plays an important role in preventing opioid overdose deaths. I think through education, partnership, and collaboration, we really get to our goals a lot quicker. Um, and we've learned in our space at CDC that we've had a lot of successes with partnering and working with communities to get this information out and to create more. Um, I feel like as an individual, we can all learn more about opioids to help people who are most at risk um, and open, for risk for opioid use disorder or overdose in their own community really increasing awareness and sharing best practices, whether that's with providers or patients or community members. Um, also making sure that there's tools available. We, we develop these tools, but work with states and others to help uh, disseminate them. And really it's important for healthcare professionals and others working in overdose prevention and treatment to have the information that they need. 
And then as a reminder, I think helping those struggling with addiction is important and that we need to help find people care and treatment necessary. And then truly supporting, you know, the work in your state. You know, I mentioned the overdose programs that we have here at CDC, um, but I think there's just so much more that can be done at, at the state level and at the federal level, and we can all better collaborate in that, in that space. And I think Prevention Week is an, a nice opportunity for us to talk about it and continue the conversation. So I thank you guys for letting me take some of your time today. My contact information is on the slide, and then I will turn it back over to David um, for the next presenter. Thank you, and I cannot thank you enough for not only that wealth of information. I was uh, particularly struck with uh, all of the infographics that I know as I, as I talk to folks around the country. Those are the, the resources that they use the most, and I'm glad that we have them in your slide deck so they can be available to the people who are listening uh, to our webinar. But one last thing, um, Lissandra, you, your presentation also exemplifies how we at the federal level are coordinating against this one common goal to address this issue. So thank you. Oh, thank Our you. next speaker uh, is also a National Prevention Week partner organization. Uh, and Dr. William Haining is going to be sharing with us uh, what he does at the organization of ASAM. Dr. Haining is an Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry and the past director of MD programs in the office of the Dean at the University of Hawaii. He directs training and resource programs in addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry. He is certified in psychiatry, addiction, psychiatry, and addiction medicine. Dr. Haining is an at-large director of ASAM. He chairs the ASAM Publications Council. He sits on the policy committee, participates in the chapter council, and is editor-in-chief of the ASAM Weekly and co-editor, co-author of the ASAM Pain and Addiction Handbook. And I know he is going to have a wealth of information for us, so welcome, Bill. Thank you, David. Well, I'm afraid that uses up most of the time, so thank you all very much. <laughs> Uh, I've actually got a fairly simple job here compared to both Jennifer and LaChandra's. Uh, I'm going to try and give a real brief overview of what the American Society of Addiction Medicine's strategic plan is, as well as its focus. Talk a little bit about a collaboration we've had with two partner organizations as an example of how those things work, and then talk a little bit more about our publications, and particularly one that has just come out. Uh, I think it's probably not general knowledge that the American Society of Addiction Medicine started up as far back as 1954, and it was intended to fill a gap in terms of physician understanding of the process of addiction and the then available remedies for it or interventions possible. Uh, what started out with an incredibly cumbersome uh, name the American Medical Society for Alcoholism and Other Drug Dependencies, or AMSAOD, fortunately became abbreviated to ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine. And a number of the listeners may be familiar with that from the ASAM criteria, which is a formal algorithm for knowing where to place people in treatment uh, who are seeking care or who are, in fact, being directed to care uh, for substance use disorders. We've got about 5,000 members, most of whom are doctoral level providers, actually most of whom are physicians, MD or DO. Uh, and there is a, uh, present in most states, there is also a subordinate organization or collaborating organization in the form of state societies. So each of these societies forms part of a confederation that contributes to the larger mission of ASAM. They are all expected to um, uh, support the same ethical code and pursue the same mission as ASAM, but they provide on an individual state basis the opportunity for folks who are listening now to actually advocate for and intervene with legislative bodies and to promote uh, care intervention 
uh, practices and policies. So I encourage folks to find out who is representing your American Society of Addiction Medicine chapter in your particular state and be willing to make contact with them because if there is one thing that, of course, will ensure that we're not successful in managing this public health issue, it will be fragmentation of our efforts. Uh, probably only cohering together is going to work well, and that's, of course, part of why we've got a webinar today involving several different agencies. Um, addiction, I've thrown up a component of the long definition that comes on the ASAM website, that addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Now, the rest of the definition goes on for another three paragraphs. It makes good reading because it does, in fact, amplify understanding of how best to provide intervention. See that we can distinguish between addiction and a great many other chronic relapsing progressive disorders based on one peculiarity of it. Uh, the disease itself tends to conceal the disease from the person with it. So when we've got someone who has an alcohol use disorder, for example, or in this case, opioid use disorder, the drugs themselves are solvents for judgment. If you are subjectively experiencing addiction, then it acts to the exclusion of an understanding of addiction. So the biggest obstacle is when you don't encounter quite so much when you're trying to manage diabetes or tuberculosis, and that is a failure on the part of the person who's suffering to actually understand that they are sick. Full stop. <laughs> Let me move on to the strategic plan here. Um, this is something that, we, that ASAM has developed on a cyclical basis since its inception and the most recent iteration of it really emphasize the need to form what Lou Baxter, Dr. Lou Baxter, called the Big Tent. And that is an effort to try and bring together as many of the organizations that have an interest in treatment and intervention as possible. Now, present here on this call are a number of federal agencies and one public organization, which is the uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, ASAM is one, really, of only of, of many professional organizations that have this targeted mission, which is to intervene successfully with what is an endemic periodically bursting out as an epidemic. The other ones, just to give you an idea of the word salad involved, um, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the Association for Medical Education and Research in Substance Abuse, or AMRSA, another federal agency or federally supported one, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, there are many examples of these organizations that share a similar intent, and what ASAM can provide with them at least, the professional organizations, is a large tent in which to congregate. Dr. Fan's presentation emphasized that a public health model is probably the most appropriate way of conceiving of this issue, in large part because a public health model describes primary, secondary, and tertiary interventions which means preventing it in the first place from ever st starting interdicting at an early enough stage to effect a cure, or in the case of the tertiary prevention efforts, minimizing the transmission or the likelihood of transmission to other folks. Uh, otherwise, opioid use in, an, uh, in the fashion we're seeing in this country really does follow the same model as propagation of the influenza virus from person to person to person, and a lot of the Factors that are essential to preventing propagation of influenza apply when we're talking about suppressing and ultimately dealing with opioid use disorders. Uh, quick emphasis, our new strategic plan is really just an adaptation to the available resources to try and bring in more folks. The, the issue at hand is one that goes back several centuries, and this is not an opportunity to start a lecture about opioid use disorder in this country. But it's actually, a, in some respects, a pretty mundane issue. The same drugs have been around for a long, long time, causing the same kind of disability and disruption. Uh, the plan focuses on, really, a future where there is effective prevention, treatment, remission, and recovery accessible to everybody. Um, and 
profoundly improves the health of everybody, bearing in mind that addiction of all sorts, not merely opioid dependence, is very much a family illness or very much a community illness. There's the one identified official sufferer, who is the person who's using the drugs, and then, of course, there are all the other folks who, uh, whose impairment or difficulties derive from the experience of the, of the identified person with substance use disorder. Somebody out there help me and come up with a much better term than addict for person with substance use disorder. Um, this is an ongoing discussion or theme in a number of the aforementioned organizations, so we'll come up with something. Meanwhile, people with addiction impact, whether intentionally or otherwise, many more folks than just themselves. So a great deal of the prevention axis of this involves interdiction at schools, working with patients and families, and then, of course, ensuring that the providers themselves are in a position to actually offer substantive aid. It's one thing to be sympathetic. It's entirely another thing to be effective. Um, the collaborations that we've had, I just wanted to give a quick example of that. I'm going to try to be brief, by the way, here, folks, because I am anticipating that with over 500 folks signed on, we just might have some questions. Um, we already, or ASAM, speaking of we, um, collaborate with a number of organizations. I gave three examples here on the slide that you can read through. A couple that are particularly useful to keep in mind were the uh, American Academy of Nurse Practitioners, excuse me, American Association of Nurse Practitioners and the American Academy of Physician Assistants, uh, who collaborated most recently with ASAM in providing access to education surrounding medication-assisted treatment. That's what this slide is meant to re refer to. Is just a mnemonic for me to remember to mention how this worked. The three organizations got together and effectively came up with an improved access to the training course that would ensure that these other physician surrogates or other healthcare providers beyond simply MDs and DOs would be in a useful and safe position for prescribing buprenorphine or other agents that interdict against opioid use. Um, folks may not be aware, but there's actually a certification process associated with using buprenorphine, uh, any of its brand names. That certification process is fairly brief, but that's not quite the same thing as um, saying that folks feel comfortable using the medication in all contexts. Um, if I am a naive 15-year-old and I open the operations manual for an automobile, I may get the sense that I know how to drive it, but um, at my own peril when I actually get behind the wheel and start steering. Panic should then rightly set in. And so it is with a lot of folks who will be trained in buprenorphine administration. It's commonly necessary to have um, uh, to have after trainings and ongoing mentoring in order to make people comfortable about safe usage of these medications. Uh, so we have programs that ASAM and, in fact, other professional organizations support, such as PCSS. Um, and of course, I slipped right by this slide, which was to give some credit to the other folks with whom ASAM works in a general partnership. These are folks who sit under the big tent. Uh, they are by no means all the same act. Everybody brings a different set of skills and a different set of aptitudes to this. I think probably if there is one thing that I'm going to provide here that may be of some utility um, is going to be really just the web address for American Society of Addiction Medicine. Org. And uh, note to all of you that there is a great deal there in resource material and in link links that will lead you to a more informed practice of intervention and treatment. So on that topic, we actually are a publications agency of our own. We have our own publication council. It produces texts. It produces journals. Journal of Addiction Medicine is a leader in the field among physicians and uh, uh, principally doctoral level providers. There is a weekly that we put out in free electronic or email form that is actually 
kind of a blog of available links for current uh, publications and addictions. And that comes out on a, as I say, on a weekly basis. We try to keep it as current as items that have popped up in the journals within the past couple weeks. Um, by way of disclosure, I do edit that journal, but it is a free membership for anybody who goes online to asam.org. Uh, look for ASAM Weekly, and it's simply a question of submitting your email address, and we'll send you that copy on a weekly basis. Um, a recent publication, and again, uh, ac acknowledging my own complicity in this, um, I'm one of the editors is the text Pain and Addiction. But the real reason for mentioning the fact that we have a text is that it filled a gap. In the course of discussing ASAM's response to the, uh, to the pain management difficulties that are associated with ongoing substance use disorder, it occurred to us there was no one text that attempted to address both problems simultaneously and the overlap between them. So a composite of uh, views was drawn together in this most recent publication. Um, it's just come out in the course of the past month, and uh, uh, some references to it are already beginning to pop up elsewhere. The most important element about this text is that it reflects an ongoing curriculum that occurs on an annual basis at the ASAM Scientific Conference. We've had close to two decades of uh, a pain and addiction course, which attempts to educate folks at every level of intervention, um, ma master's level and above, in how best to deal with the very challenging issue of management of pain in the context of addiction. So there, I think I have probably been blissfully brief. Um, it, it, it's for anybody who is listening in on this, I have to tell you, uh, staring at a wall while addressing a partnership of 600 folks is a little daunting because I can either imagine you all sitting back there and, and being bored to tears, um, or I can delude myself into thinking that what I'm saying is really interesting. If you have any doubt about either, my address is haining, H-A-N-I-N-G, at hawaii.edu. Um, and no, we are not plagued by volcanoes across the entire chain right now, merely on a corner of one island. Um, I'll turn this back, I think, to David at this point, uh, and we'll stand by for the next speaker. So thank you, Bill. Um, I, what I love about you being a part of this presentation is that I, I think it's va always valuable when we're talking about opioids uh, to know that Pain and addiction is a part of the discussion. Uh, so thank you for bringing that piece to it. And also thank you for, for being on the phone with us because I imagine it's somewhere around 5 or 6 a.m. In, in Hawaii. <laughs> so our final speaker is Lori Barno, and she's the Senior Director of Youth Development at Boys and Girls Club of America, overseeing health and wellness strategies, initiatives, and programs to, en health, to enhance health in our school time through social and emotional development and health promotion practices. She brings to us 10 years of expertise in adolescent health, curriculum development, and training and technical assistance to this role, having previously been an integral part of the adoption of adolescent health programs in Georgia school districts. And just as a side note, Lauren is proud to have been recently recognized as one of Boys and Girls Clubs of America's Rookie of the Year. Congratulations and welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much, David. I didn't realize that last note would be included about me, but it is something <laughs> I'm excited about. Um, we so. Um, Sure, thank you. Um, so welcome all. My name is Lauren Barano, and I'm a Senior Director of Health and Wellness at Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Um, we're excited to be presenters on this webinar to share our substance use prevention strategy and a very specific resource guide that we just recently released to support its adoption in clubs. Um, so I'll walk through sort of some of um, Boys and Girls Clubs' uh, history and then dive into the resource. 
So as an organization, Boys and Girls Clubs of America is in a unique position uh, because more than, uh, more than 150 years, we have really opened our doors during out-of-school time to give young people a safe place to learn and grow in those after-school, evening, and summer hours. Um, and that out-of-school time gives us some really vital opportunity to reach young people who need us the most. Our vision is to keep all members on track to graduate um, from high school with a plan for their future, to demonstrate good character and citizenship, and to live a healthy lifestyle. What really makes our clubs unique is that we are everywhere. Boys and girls clubs are in almost every congressional district in the U.S. We are in urban, suburban, and rural neighborhoods. We are on military installations, and we serve native youth. We have over 4,300 clubs and reach over 4 million youth annually. And so uh, we define what we call the club experience as the sum total of everything that a child receives or experiences when they walk through the doors. So the facility, the staff and their uh, staff practices, the programs, the schedule of activities. And through a lot of research, we've determined that there are really five core key elements that create a high quality club experience for kids. Uh, so members should, when they come through our doors, feel physically and emotionally safe. They should have fun. They should receive support and recognition from caring adults who set expectations for them, and they should always feel a sense of belonging. And so by studying the club experience, uh, we have realized that young people that have a high-quality club experience have stronger outcomes. So kids are more likely to graduate from high school, be physically active, and have healthier choices, to volunteer, and to believe that their schoolwork is meaningful. So here at BGCA, we are highly focused on providing high quality youth development experiences so that every young person who enters a club has the highest uh, quality experience possible. So what we were hearing uh, is that many of our clubs are located within areas of the U.S. who've been particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic. Um, and clubs with, exist within communities, and so as a result, they're really grappling with the effects of the opioid epidemic. So what we were specifically hearing is that clubs were looking for um, how to support staff and youth members dealing with trauma from loss as a result of the opioid epidemic. Uh, clubs were looking for tools to really promote substance use prevention within their clubs and within, uh, with their members. And really, uh, clubs were also looking for resources and guidance for working with communities uh, more broadly on this issue. As several previous preventers have uh, mentioned, this sort of work does not happen in one space alone, but among communities broadly. And so as a response to this call for action, BGCA developed a substance use prevention strategy uh, and a resource guide to very specifically get clubs started um, in implementing some of this strategy work. So based on evidence-based practices and current research, BGCA developed a substance use prevention strategy. Uh, and key pieces of established research and uh, framing that really guided our work were both NIH's prevention principles and SAMHSA's strategic planning framework. And from this, uh, and really guided by this, we developed a strategy that we knew would best meet the needs of a really diverse group of clubs. Um, so our primary work is to recognize that many of our youth and therefore subsequently the staff that serve them, their families, and people in their broader communities have very likely experienced trauma in their lives. And in many ways, the use of opioids in their communities was compounding this trauma uh, or introducing new trauma. So therefore, we developed a strategy that recognizes this trauma and integrates specific trauma-informed principles and approaches. And you'll see this referenced and described throughout the guide and really included in many of the tools and activities. In addition, we focused specifically on building social and emotional development skills as a core health promotion practice. As many of you know, substance use prevention research indicates that youth with more developed SED skills are less likely to use substances. So our strategy uh, focuses on building the four core skills of healthy relationships with self, healthy relationships with others, emotional regulation, and responsible decision making uh, to drive the building the skills necessary to avoid substance use.
And then finally, our strategy is guided by sort of a, a whole child approach to really ensure that club members uh, are seen and responded to as their whole selves. So we are responding to emotional, physical, and mental well-being, and we're guiding and supporting young people to be successful over a lifetime. And so this means that we're in integrating and engaging families and communities within substance use prevention work to ensure that youth are receiving consistent messages about substance use and feel supported throughout all aspects of their lives. And again, you'll see these elements show up throughout the substance use guide uh, as the underpinning of our approach. So let's talk about the guide a bit more specifically. Um, we designed this tool um, to support the adoption of our strategy, and within it, in the, the front matter, we provided a broad overview of the opioid epidemic and the, ro the role that clubs can play. Um, so this includes pull-out infographics, um, or fact sheets that describe adverse childhood experiences and tr other types of trauma, the use of opioids and substances and the ways those are related, and other helpful information to frame and contextualize the issue. Uh, now, I'll be clear, our guide is certainly not brief. It's a rich 130 pages. And so what we did was divide it into four clear sections for maximum usability. So first, we really uh, built the capacity of staff to be prepared to address opioid use with club members in the club setting. We uh, secondly engaged youth in their own prevention efforts to really facilitate youth-led prevention work. Third, we engaged families and partners in this work to echo messages and start conversations between adults and children that mirrored what was happening in the club. And then lastly, to partner with communities to enhance prevention work more broadly. Um, and so when we were discussing this guide with local clubs to get feedback on it, shape our work, and this resource guide development, it was absolutely clear that the clubs that were most successful in substance use prevention were successful because they were working with partners within their communities to make this work most effective. So we recognize that substance use prevention doesn't happen in a Boys and Girls Club alone, uh, but really also in partnership with other community agencies and subject matter experts who are able to coordinate and guide collaborative efforts. So if there's one thing that we could uh, really leave you with outside of our resource guide today, it's that I encourage you to find and partner with the local Boys and Girls Club in your community. Uh, it's very likely that they're already doing this work or they're currently primed and ready to lead this work in your community. Uh, so they can really serve as a, a valuable partner. So within the guide, um, you will find uh, many strategies which in, within each of those four domains, uh, so staff, youth, families, and communities. And then to supplement each individual strategy, there are really specific tools and templates. So for example, there's an environmental assessment uh, to help determine what you're already doing in a substance use prevention space, what some agencies' gaps may be, uh, and what substances might be most prevalent in communities. There's a local funding template we developed that we uh, pre-included some information about the opioid epidemic and helped guide um, folks that are newer to this work into where they might be able to find some of their local data. We provided a sample MOU so that we could um, help formalize many of the partnerships that we know are uh, somewhat existing but, but could really be strengthened around this work. And then we provided um, another example is a community mapping assessment to really identify who key partners, people, agencies, and resources in communities uh, who could, we could connect with related to this work. And then there are several um, very specific activities that you could utilize with uh, club members, young people in your community, or families. So for example, we've developed lesson plans focused on opioid prevention uh, that are for each age level, including elementary. So I noticed one uh, person's comment was specifically about how to address um, young people, people younger than 12. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, that we're reaching young kids as, as young as 6 to 8. Second, we have an example parent night or family night agenda if you're looking to develop some programming specifically to engage families or trusted adults within a community and get young people talking together and then hopefully later talking specifically about substance use. And then we have a lesson planning template. So if you're a local agency and you're looking to design or develop your own lessons around substance use prevention, um, there's a template that includes some really great high quality youth development practices and elements that can use to guide uh, and make your opioid lesson most effective.
So I just want to show you briefly what this looks like on paper. Uh, so this is an example of our resource or some of the resources we've got. This would be like a pull-out page or something that a site could easily make copies of to distribute to you know, board members, community partners, to really frame and contextualize issues around opioids and other substance use issues. We've also included a lot of templates as I mentioned. This is an example of the community asset map um, to identify and um, come up with some specific ways that you can partner with different agencies in your community. Uh, so working through this with uh, a community collaborative might be really beneficial. And then we've included a bunch of activities. So like I mentioned, this is a sample lesson for elementary schoolers called I've Got Big Plans, where they really outline uh, and think about themselves as middle school, high school, um, and adult people, and what they think that using substances might do to those visions they have for their future selves. Um, so to get access to the guide, you are welcome to email me. As soon as I finish my piece, I will put my email in the chat box so I can send you a direct PDF. Uh, and I believe that the organizers of today's webinar will send out this information as a follow-up. So you'll get a link to the, um, the actual PDF of our guide as well. So I really appreciate you all um, for taking the time to learn a bit about our resource and hope that it is helpful as well as um, encourage you to think more about a Boys and Girls Club in your local community as a place to get started in really doing this work collaboratively. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you for sharing your perspective. We can't talk about this issue without talking about youth development. So that was very valuable. Everyone, we do have time for a few uh, question and answers. Uh, I just want to remind uh, everyone that we've been trying to answer your questions in the chat box. Um, I'm going to uh, read out some questions that I think are pertinent to specific panel members, and then a few questions that I would like the whole panel to uh, address before we close. Uh, so my first question is for my colleague, um, which is, is SAMHSA working with the medical schools and organizations to train students and professionals around this issue? Okay. Um, on the prevention side, I'm not sure. I know on the treatment side, especially in regards to um, buprenorphine, uh, they have uh, linked with faculty members and, and uh, uh, teaching physicians in, in getting to, to the medical students. Um, so that they they go through the training for buprenorphine, and so that they are data wavered by the time they um, they graduate or in the process of, and so hoping to increase the number of um, of uh, prescribers, healthcare professionals who can, you know, as they as they do practice in a primary care setting or anywhere else, that they do have the background so that if they do have a patient that becomes dependent on an opioid, that they're able to treat that dependency and addiction eventually. So helping to increase the capacity for uh, treatment. Um, and then even beyond, even when a physician has graduated medical school, you know, there's a lot of courses in, in terms of how to use opioids um, appropriately, um, how to monitor patients, um, what to do uh, in terms of when you find that a patient becomes dependent or addicted, uh, and, and, and how to refu uh, refer patients to the appropriate sources and, and provide resources for them. Um, SAMHSA does have the PCSS uh, mentoring network. I believe it's called Practitioner Clinical Support System. And basically, it connects um, outside prescribers if they have any questions on how to prescribe opioids, what to do when a, their patient becomes addicted to opioids. You can actually link up to a healthcare professional who is um, knowledgeable in that area, and they'll walk you through. And that resource also contains other materials as well that can help the, the prescriber 
out there in the community. Thanks, hey, Jen. David, is uh, it possible for me to answer that too? This is LaShondra. Absolutely. Just because it was very distinct to something that we're doing. Um, so the provider training that we're developing, the Applying CDC Guideline for Prescribing Opioids, that series was originally developed intentionally to help medical schools and nursing schools. So when the guideline was first released, we had a series of voluntary commitments from 60 medical schools, I believe 90 nursing schools, and about 50 colleges of pharmacy, schools of pharmacy, that were going to be committed to educating their students about opioid use, whether that's counseling patients or appropriate use of naloxone or um, whatever specific to um, opioid prescribing. And so we started development of that series in conjunction with those organizations. We worked with them and did a series of listening sessions to find out what topics they wanted covered, what kind of content they wanted to be addressed, whether that was for uh, where, whatever standing you were in medical school and for those who had already completed their medical training. And so our series for training is developed based on that um, and continues to be uh, in conjunction with our partners at SAMHSA and, and, and other federal agencies as well. So um, our training is specifically designed for those individuals. Thank you, Lissandra. Um, and keep your line unmuted because this is a question that came in several times from many people that I'm going okay. to direct to you first, and then I hope that the other panelists can chime in. Uh, the question is, have physicians been open to dosing suggestions? So, um, and I'm going to start with a, a, a non-answer, so, um, so maybe you shouldn't have kicked it to me. Um, no, yes and no. I think what we're finding is that we have a lot of physicians that were looking for guidance, um, and a lot of the tools that we, clinical tools that we developed for physicians around dosing have been very well received. So we actually have um, dosing information in our mobile app. We have a pocket guide around tapering and then dosing specific fact sheets that we have, uh, calculating dose. Uh, for opioids and um, a few others. So we've had a lot of successful engagement with those products um, that to us is an indicator that it's being utilized. Um, in terms of direct complaint or vocalization in terms of not supporting that, it's been very minimal, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So I would say yes over our, overarching, um, but we have had some issues with folks uh, being concerned about the, the, the dosing that we're suggesting and recommending. Um, but that's in alignment with other guidelines and clinical practice. So, thank you, Dr. Haining. Did you did you have anything else to add to that? We've actually just using this medical school as an example been teaching the use of naltrexone and of buprenorphine for a number of years, as well as addressing this as a as a sidebar in the behavioral health curriculum. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that it takes repetition, it takes reiteration. Uh, when we do it with the students, they of course aren't in a position to do any prescribing even when they graduate. They will be going into residencies and their prescribing capability will be under supervision and will also be tied to whatever their hospital training uh, pharmacy license is. So they're really not they're not flying solo until they're out of the residency. And if we don't maintain contact with them or continue to provide reinforcement over time, then they'll lose both the initiative, lose the incentive to go ahead and prescribe as well as the capability of doing it. So very much as LaShondra said, the PCSS is a valuable tool in trying to bring people back into the fold and get them to use this. The only difficulty that I think I've had in our area with regard to the toolkit is an over-interpretation of what the morphine milliequivalence uh, means for two specific drugs, buprenorphine and methadone, which are not intended to be included in that list of other opioids for equivalency purposes because they work differently. The pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are different. Why that's an issue is that legislators get a hold of these things and they begin to start well-meaningly uh, putting con restrictions on how the medications are are prescribed. Um, that's that's really about all I need to say on that. Thank you. This question is uh, specific, I think, to you, Lauren, but I, I, I think it could also be answered maybe by other panelists. Um, the question is, have you found engaging families in your prevention difficult? 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, we find that as an out-of-school time provider, um, families are often at our sites every day doing pickup. And so there is a real opportunity for families to engage uh, in our sites. Um, so whether that means schools can leverage Boys and Girls Clubs as the after-school time provider or summer provider to get additional information out about initiatives that might actually be happening on school, um, or for example, uh, that, I know one club site does, is really effective at doing what they call stay in plays. Uh, so inviting family members to stay an additional 20 minutes at pickup um, to help encourage uh, a really specific activity like doing a craft, creating a healthy recipe, learning a bit about substance use prevention, um, right? That small interaction provides real opportunity to strengthen and echo messages that are happening in the club and have them be shared in families. Uh, and the second piece I'll add is we would really encourage families to not dive into the substance use conversation first, but rather encourage families to start talking about other things. How are you? How is your day? What's going on with your friends? And, and being a real askable parent or askable trusted adult from the beginning makes those substance use conversations much easier as time goes on. Uh, so we find, you know, with anyone, I would think that, of course, engaging families in today's busy lives is a bit challenging, but we present a real value add as an out-of-school time provider in creating that space for um, happen, having that happen uh, during pickup, after pickup, uh, or because of the strong relationships we have with families. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that before I move to the next question? Okay. Jen, I have one for you. How does SAMHSA envision partnerships? And I like this question since the genesis of this, this webinar is around partnering for opioid addiction prevention. How does SAMHSA envision partnerships with federally qualified health centers and community centers to treat the opioid epidemic? Hmm. Um, well, I know it talks about treatment, but from the prevention side, um, grant-wise, we actually do have a grant program. Um, one was just announced pretty recently, and I believe the first offering was last year. Um, and where um, FQHCs as well as OTPs are qualified, are eligible to apply for this grant where um, the, the FQHC or OTP with the community to be engaged and develop, well, community prescribers, to develop um, protocols and, and training for naloxone, um, how to reach out to the community um, about education on overdose, about um, using naloxone for overdose rever reversal, and, and of that nature. So I think that in itself is a good partnership in, in trying to um, have, have these community centers and OP treatment programs to be engaged in their community to help combat the crisis. Um, I do know there is a HRSA SAMHSA partnership in terms of um, uh, treatment using evidence based treatment training and all of that nature. I don't really have the specifics of that, um, but if you would uh, need any more specifics, please uh, contact me and I can get you that information. But I think it's it's a good um, pathway, it's a good avenue to to begin, and because FQACs, there's so much into, they're very uh, embedded in the community, and they can have an impact um, at the community level uh, this, on this crisis. And get the word out there, reach out to prescribers, reaching out to, to the population in general, and I think it's, uh, I hope that there will be a, a more of a partnership in our future. Thanks, Jen. Don't mute because I'm going, to sh I'm going to start this last final question with you and then open it up to the panelists. Is SAMHSA or any of the other organizations on the panel working with the medical schools and organizations to train students and professionals specifically around this issue? Is it 
similar to the one that we uh, you had asked before um, in terms of providing the education with the buprenorphine uh, in the medical schools, and then I had mentioned also the PCSS program. A, a little, I think. I think. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, one of the or two of the questions that came in really wanted um, the other organizations to expand on that, if they could. So the driving organizations for the medical school education initiatives are the American Academy, American Association of Medical Colleges and the organization that accredits medical schools, uh, the LCME, or Liaison Committee for Medical Education, and for graduate programs, residency programs, the ACGME. My reason for giving you the, the letter salad there is because there are a bunch of folks involved in this who push and drive education within medical education environs. And they've all been very active and they've all been very forceful. SAMHSA and CSAT have been quite active in providing us the materials with which to uh, initiate an understanding of proper pain management and, uh, and opioid use disorder treatment. Um, th that stuff is, th we're, we're not at a loss for what to teach folks. What is obligatory here is getting people to develop a r routine or a tradition of being educated in intervention. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, unfortunately, we weren't able to address all of your questions. I do want to say that when we do send out uh, the slide presentations to everybody who has registered, you will also get a copy of the chat pod, which had many of the resources that people were asking questions about and some of the questions that were answered. Um, I do want to end by saying thank you to all of our presenters and to all of you who participated in the webinar today. We do hope that the information has been valuable to, to you. So please, uh, if you can, tell us what you think about this webinar by filling out the post-meeting survey that will pop up once this meeting ends because your, your feedback is so very valuable as we continue to do this webinar series. Again, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your participation in National Prevention Week, and we hope for your continued collaboration. Have a great day.